Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and welcome on this beautiful day. Just um, a couple of announcements. The session will be meeting tomorrow night, Monday night, and we will be again having a long conversation about um, when and how to start meeting together in person. So since the July twins will be coming out next week, there will be all of the information that you will need to know about that will be in the twins. So look for that. This is the day which the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. No longer enslaved to sin, but set free through grace to be instruments of righteousness, we come before God to confess the ways that we fail to follow Christ. So let us confess our sin. Let us pray. O merciful God, our loyalties have been divided and we have taken your grace for granted. You seek us out, but we attempt to go our own way. You provide, but we hoard. You free us from enslavement to sin, but we neglect to be instruments of righteousness. You welcome us as we are, but we refuse to receive others in your name. Forgive what we have been, amend what we will be, awaken us to the new thing you are doing within and around us. Send your spirit to shape us in ways that better reflect the one we claim to follow, Jesus Christ our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven, and glory be to God. In response to this good news of grace and forgiveness, let us share the peace of Christ with one another. Share with those who are you are sitting with. Share through an email or a phone call or a text. The peace of Christ be with you. The Old Testament lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Listen now for God's word. After these things, God tested Abraham. God said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah 
and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. In the Gospel of our Lord, according to Matthew, from Matthew, the 10th chapter, verses 40 through 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever ever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, to whom or what are we loyal? What drives our actions and dictates our choices, and therefore the course of our lives and the course of our world. What or whom do we receive or reject? This morning's readings offer the opportunity to delve into rock-bottom questions about our ultimate allegiances and how those affections and those affinities either guide us or rule us. 
this passage from Genesis that I read gives us that iconic, troubling, terrifying text of the almost sacrifice of Isaac. The details of the story haunt us. Take your son, your only son, the one whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering. Abraham built the altar, laid the wood upon it, bound his son, laid Isaac on the altar on top of the wood, and took in his hand the knife to kill his son, his only son. Yes, we know the angel speaks and stops the murder just at the right moment, just at the last minute. God provides the ram in the thicket. All is well? You know, think about it. How does a father-son relationship recover from this kind of trauma? God may well be pleased with Abraham's loyalty, but what of Isaac's view of his own father? Does not that family dynamic matter to God at all? What does Isaac now think of the God of his father? Is this what faithfulness and righteousness look like? The, the larger point that our loyalty belongs to God, that nothing truly belongs to us, that we ought to be prepared to hand over all that we have, all that we are, lose our lives for the sake of the gospel. That point certainly gets made in this horrific story. Nonetheless, such a traumatic tale doesn't make God look very appealing. Does God really test us with such cruelness? The litmus test for divine loyalty that Jesus poses in the Matthew passage for this morning, however, is a kinder, gentler one, especially as compared to the Genesis story. Those who welcome Jesus, he says, welcome the little ones. Even giving a cup of water to followers of Jesus will be noticed and will be rewarded. There's no need to sacrifice your firstborn, he's telling us. Receiving the Lord's disciples and tending to the least of these will suffice. The contrast between these two passages, these two stories, seem so stark. And yet, without the willingness to give up that which we love the most for God, we will be unwilling to receive the unlovely, those we may deem unlovable, our enemies even, in Jesus' name. If we do not seek daily to love God with our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength, we will be wholly unable to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's, I think, the connection between these two seemingly opposing stories of worshiping and serving God. If our confidence is not in God's ability and willingness to provide, we will be incapable of giving up anything that we deem our own. If we do not believe that all that we have we steward for God's will, we will do everything possible to protect ourselves and hoard what we mistakenly believe we are entitled to have. The story of Abraham's willingness to hand over Isaac to God brings painfully home the truth that everything, all creation, 
those and that whom we hold dearest, do not belong to us. If we do not understand this to the core of our being, we will refuse even a cup of water to those dying of thirst. The earth is the Lord's and all that is within it. This is not our country. This is not our land. This is not our property. This is not our church. Even our children are not ours. When we come not only to acknowledge this truth in theory, but put it into practice, we give and we receive differently. We hold on loosely to things and to people and invite God to show us how to accept that which comes into our lives and to let go of that which we steward but do not own. So I don't pretend to be good at this. I confess that all too often I've attempted to control that which I ought to have received and manage that which I should have entered into as a mystery. I've stockpiled jugs of water when others were desperately needing only a little cup to drink. I've thought about inequity. I've talked about injustice but been reluctant to give up much of what I label as mine for the sake of those who are long disadvantaged. In short, I've been a slave to sin, as Paul says, even though Christ has come to set me free. The jarring nature of this story of the near sacrifice of Isaac should shock us out of any complacency or illusion that our faith does not demand real sacrifice. When I read this story in particular, during this season of our life together, a season of COVID-19, which disproportionately kills people of color and disproportionately impacts those already on the economic edge, I realize that my unwillingness to hand over even just a cup of water and my inability to recognize that everything belongs to God has cost people their lives and their livelihoods. When I read about Abraham's faith and understand the cheap grace too often evident in how I live out my own faith, I understand that my worship of lesser gods has cost other parents their children. Sacrificed to lead-infused water or poverty or inaccessible health care, or underfunded schools, or gun violence, or police brutality, so many other altars of adulterous gods, idolatrous gods. I'm afraid that my un unwillingness to recognize that the earth is the Lord's and all that is within it that my ultimate loyalty is to Jesus Christ and that I am to give and to receive knowing that nothing is truly mine. That has meant that I've been willing to sacrifice other people's children on the altars of false gods like greed and scarcity and security and self-protection. I've been reading and listening to the Reverend William Barber a lot during these last months. He's a pastor from North Carolina, uh, African-American, who is heading up a 
Poor People's Campaign for this time and continues to inform us and to help us to realize and recognize the poverty that still exists in our nation, especially the numbers of children who live in poverty in the United States. A couple of Sundays ago, he preached at the Washington's National Cathedral. And he preached from the prophet Amos, from the fifth chapter. And he kept repeating this refrain, which echoes in this time and continues to haunt me. He repeated this refrain in his sermon. We have become too comfortable with the death of others. We have become too comfortable with the death of others. And in light of this morning's readings from Genesis and Matthew, we could say we've become too comfortable with the forced sacrifice of others' children because we have refused to receive all children, all children, as God's own. Have we forgotten that we have been set free from sin have we forgotten that God provides? Have we forgotten that whoever receives these little ones receives Jesus Christ and the one who sent him? Have we, have we forgotten where our ultimate loyalty lies and who alone we worship? It's well past time to remember and to live accordingly. And may it be so. And thanks be to God. Amen. This morning, as we are aware of the many needs and concerns that we have continuing in our, in our families, in our community, in our world, we continue to think about the role of racism and prejudice in our society and our country and the ways it is manifest, the ways that we continue to try to think and th the ways we try to defend ourselves, we good people. We have concerns still about the numbers of people who have been affected by COVID-19. The numbers seem to be growing in many parts of the country. Many, many more cases, many more deaths, many more hospital beds filled. So we continue to remember all of those families impacted by this. And in the midst of this pandemic, we hear that maybe the administration is trying to do away again with the Affordable Care Act, which, of course, as you remember, includes um, those with pre-existing conditions. So with all of these concerns swirling around all of the, the needs that we know of, the needs that you know, that I don't know, we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, we bow in prayer, humbled by the reality that you want to spend time with us. You long to be in relationship with us. You receive us and care for us, no matter where we have been or what we have done or how often we have neglected your will. Such knowledge is too wonderful for us, such grace beyond our comprehension. We rest in your compassionate presence, freed from sin and alive to the transformation you promise. Awed by your mercy and kindness, we seek to respond with bold faith. Strengthen our resolve 
to follow where Christ leads and obey his commandment to love. In a world overflowing with anger and division, send us to be ambassadors of reconciliation. In the wake of injustice and pain, use us as instruments of righteousness and healing. As your creation groans for relief, make us bearers of hope and catalysts of life-giving change. And when our faith is tested and we do not feel up to the demands of discipleship, remind us that you provide. Help us to remember that ram in the thicket, the manna in the desert, the water from the rock, the feeding of the 5,000. Send your Holy Spirit to spark our imagination and embolden our witness so that none of your little ones are hungry or thirsty. Free from sin and alive in Christ Jesus, we pray without reserve for those people and places, circumstances, and situations that weigh on our hearts and minds this morning. We ask you to provide healing to the sick. We look to you to ease the suffering of those hurting in body and mind and spirit. We plead on behalf of the long oppressed and for those still waiting for justice. We yearn for you to guide all of those in positions of leadership to make decisions that reflect your will. We rest in your compassionate presence, freed from sin, alive and awaiting the transformation you promise. Hear our prayers, O God, for we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to be bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As God's own, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, and patience, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, and crown all these things with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.